Henry House. This will be our Eco Open Houses video tour for 2020. So come with us. Here we are in our back garden. We're very lucky to have a big walled garden. It goes round behind the houses next door, which explains its size. And it turns out it's a perfect place for bees. So I'm going to take you up the steps here and out to where the hive is and show you some of the things about our bees. Surprisingly, under all this vegetation, there's a really big pond. Those are the beautiful king cups, which are in full flower at the moment. It's quite a deep pond, about three foot deep actually. Bees really need water, so they like to be situated quite close to a pond if possible. So I was very fortunate, three years ago, I went to the South of England show with my family, and I got to go in and handle the bees with my granddaughter, Rosa. We were thrilled, and she said, Nana, you should keep bees. So that summer, my children gave me a hive over here. It's a traditional WBC hive. And you can see bees going in and out of it. There they are, the girls. They're off collecting nectar and pollen to feed babies and make honey. It's a good day for them today. It's the sun's out. They love it. So... After I acquired the hive, um, I did my training with Worthing Beekeepers Association over the winter. And then in the spring, in May, I got a call from Guy Wheatley uh, to say that there was a swarm at Davidson High School for Girls, causing mayhem. Uh, I went over there in my car and we put bees into an old laundry basket, wrapped it up in a big sheet, put them in the back of my old jag drove back here and hived the bees into this hive. I'm very happy they've been in there. They turned out to be very peaceful and industrious bees. Within six weeks, I managed to take 20 pounds of delicious honey. So delicious that in fact it won prizes in the honey show at the Finden Sheep Fair later that year. So it turns out this is a perfect garden for bees. Uh, it's organic. It's got lots of flowers and it's near lots of other gardens and it has a pond. We call this the watershed. Let me show you what's inside. These tanks originally contained pineapple juice, which was imported. They now contain two types of water, rainwater and grey water. The first ones were installed in 2004 and since have been expanded to almost 20 tonnes of capacity. Most of the tanks collect filtered rainwater from the roofs via guttering and pipework, which Karen will show you shortly. Some of the tanks store water that has been in the pool, which we recycle by using it to flush all five toilets. That's around 250 flushes a day. We use no mains water for the toilets. Each week we pump enough water from the pool to fill the grey water tanks. We re then, then refill the pool with fresh water from the other tanks. The watershed is built against a south facing brick wall which acts as a solar storage heater to preheat the water. 
We estimate this system saves between 200,000 and 500,000 litres of tap water every year. This depends, of course, on the rainfall. I thank you. So now we get on to one of the most exciting parts of our tour. We're really thrilled by this. Deep flow guttering and a little join pipe that goes through the roof. What we did with our water system was to join up the various bits of guttering on the house so that we could channel most of the water into the tanks for the rainwater recycling system. So I'm going to show you some of the joins now and what we did. So as we come around here, you can see various bits of pipework running across the flat roof. And a pipe running across the flat roof there. If you look up slightly, you'll see the guttering running along the, along the edge of the west facing roof. Which as it goes over to the right, drops into this bit of guttering here. And what you can't see above that is a bit of pipe was stuck through a little low roof to catch all the water on the front south facing side of the building. Huge amount of roof up there and a lot of water collected. So then all that water comes down here, down this pipe, and into these various pipes running across the flat roof here. Along here doing a little right angle turn. This is the top of the pool. And along. And then down into some guttering. And along it goes. So then run down through a filter into the tanks in our water recycling sheds. In addition to our original system, what we added in 2015 was deep flow guttering. The existing guttering was doing a good job, but we were concerned that when it rains heavily, the water would slosh out of the, uh, of the guttering. We'd lose quite a lot, it seemed like a waste. So we replaced most of the guttering on the house with deep flow guttering. Ordinary guttering has a sort of semi-circular profile, but deep flow guttering is elliptical and collects up to 50% more of the water. Um, we found this was really effective. Plus, it was really cheap. I think the um, 18 metres of deep flow guttering cost £35.70 plus VAT, and the joiners were 95 pence. So the whole system cost us very little to replace the existing guttering. Plus, we took advantage of when the house was painted on the outside and the scaffolding was up, we changed the guttering at that time. This has saved us a huge amount of money and it's very satisfying to us to hear that water sloshing along and into the tanks. Henry House has two types of solar panels, photovoltaic or PV, which produces electricity directly from the daylight. Also, solar water heating panels on the south facing roof. PV is most popular in this country, but it's worth noting that solar water panels are vastly more efficient by area. As a rule of thumb in the UK, full sunlight delivers up to 1000 watts of energy to each square meter of the surface it falls on. A PV panel of one square meter can convert this to approximately 200 watts of electrical power. The same size solar water panel can produce approximately 900 watts in hot water. The four home-built water panels were installed on the south-facing roof in 2003. The system is very simple. The panels are connected to a coiled pipe in the bottom of the house's hot water tank. 
When the water in the panels is hotter than the water in the bottom of the tank, and you'll remember that hot water rises to the top, a small pump circulates the panel's water to the coils or heat exchanger which transfers the energy into the tank. This system has been running for 18 years with almost no maintenance, serving all the showers and taps. Gas backup is not usually switched on between April and September. The solar PV panels over the pool room were installed in 2011. The tubular design is used because they're efficient despite being laid flat rather than tilted towards the sun. It also means the wind won't pick them up. The system can provide up to 5 kilowatts of AC power for use in the building, charging the car and of course sold back to the grid. We get paid more than a thousand pounds a year for generating electricity for the grid. Swimming pool water must of course be treated and filtered to prevent infection spreading. So we monitor very carefully at all times the levels of disinfectant and also the pH, the alkalinity, the total dissolved solids and so on to make sure the water is perfectly safe for swimmers but also very comfortable for them. Modern parents and carers will be particularly concerned about the safety of their babies or their disabled relatives when swimming in a hot pool. We test the water ourselves every two hours and we also send samples away to Worthing Borough Council to their environmental health department. Our test results are absolutely excellent. In 2011, we decided to upgrade our system and switch to an eco sanitizer. This was pretty state of the art at that time. Uh, it's an ionizer. Really, basically what it does is you put a bit of salt in the pool. So you have a very weak solution of salt, rather similar to human tears. And then that runs through an ionizer, which splits the sodium chloride, the salt, into the ions, sodium and chlorine. Those chlorine ions then combine with any bacteria, viruses, or maybe hair gel, anything else that might be in the pool, preventing uh, safety and bather comfort. We found the system works excellently and our tests have continued to be fantastic. It also has the advantage that it's much, much kinder to skin and eyes. So we don't have anybody getting red eye or irritated skin. In fact, people with psoriasis find that swimming in the pool rather like the Dead Sea improves their psoriasis. It's also good for eczema. Three years ago, we decided to upgrade the system further and move to a, a more modern eco sanitizer. So what we did was install two in parallel, which work in the same way, but that now means that if we have a problem with one, we're not kind of stuck. So now we're going to show you the equipment in the pool room over here. So ahead on the wall there you can see the two monitors which check the levels in the pool and adjust them accordingly. You can also manually adjust if you feel you need to turn it up or turn it down at any time. To the right these two pod-like objects are the actual sanitizers. They contain the electrical plates which then ionise the sodium chloride or salt and split it into the sodium and chlorine ions which clear, clean the water for us. Down here we have the probes which are checking what's going on in the water and then you can see some little tubes running near them as well. So back up again to the right near to the pods we have the system that checks and doses if the pH goes too high. With this system the pool tends to get a bit alkaline over time and to make sure it's nice and comfortable for people with the usual pH similar to tears and so on, it will just pump a little tiny bit of acid, little drops of acid into the pool water to bring the pH down. We found it's a very effective system and creates not only a safe 
environment, safe pool water, but the water feels silky smooth, it's very pleasant to bathe in. When I moved into Henry House in 1997, I found a very beautiful garden, but completely chemically based, with hardly any wildlife whatsoever. I'd been an organic gardener for 30 years, and for me two of the key things were composting, so nothing wasted, kitchen scraps or weeds, all reused, and shredding and mulching. So what I've done here is to mulch heavily throughout the garden. If you pan over this way, you can see my two raised beds here. There's a heavy mulch on top of there. Throughout the winter, I'll be pruning the shrubs and trees. I then shred the prunings and put a heavy layer onto the raised beds. This does a number of things. It keeps the weeds down, but it also means you don't have to water, hardly at all. Um, a couple of summers ago when we had a drought, I didn't water my runner beans for six weeks and they were delicious and I had loads of them. It also nourishes the soil so if you look at the, the back raised bed there that was a very heavy depleted clay soil that we dug out when we put some more tanks in for the water recycling and by putting heavy mulch on regularly that's now been transformed into really good soil. When you can see my nectarine I planted there doing rather well this year. So I find also with mulching, it cuts down on the work a lot. So basically you prune something, you shred it, you stick it on, that's that bush done for the year. I never go to the dump with any residual stuff. I have some large pieces of wood that won't go to the shed at the back there that we burn occasionally. So we now found in the garden that there being very little wildlife, we now have damselflies, dragonflies, frogs, toads, and sometimes we see bats. Thank you for watching our Eco Open Houses virtual tour. We look forward to seeing you as soon as possible. Where the bees, the honey bees, we've got.